This is Jeffrey Rickman, and this is my show, Plain Spoken. I'm starting a new series where I'm interviewing representatives from other Wesleyan uh, denominations, covenant bodies, to, to try and discern uh, what's a good fit for different congregations coming out of the United Methodist Church or maybe non-denominational congregations that are looking at um, covenant bodies that are uh, Wesleyan, Arminian, and dispositions. So um, this is the very first one of this series. This is going to be the Congregational Methodist Church. Today, I'm very happy to be joined by uh, Jim Hancock. And so, Jim, thank you so much for, for joining me today. You're very welcome. Thank you. God bless. Would you, um, just briefly for me um, and, and the audience, what, what's your title? What's your function? Uh, help us have confidence that, that you are the guy to represent your crew. Sure, I appreciate that. And and one of the things you're going to find out a little bit more about us is that we're not really big into titles. Uh, we're because we are all volunteers in essence, uh, even all of our leadership within our denomination. However, uh, myself, I serve on the board for uh, for the church ministries division, which is one of our three divisions in our denomination. Uh, and I am I'm actually the one that was. Uh, that was put in charge of the affiliate initiative. So those churches that are seeking to affiliate with us, whether they're coming from the UMC or other denominations or other situations, that that the the funnel of information and the consistency of the messages are 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 across the board, uh, and 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 that's what I was asked to do from our board on our division. I do serve as secretary uh, officer on that particular board. Uh, additionally, I serve as the vice chairman of the West Tennessee Annual Conference for our denomination. And, uh, and, and uh, lastly, uh, I pastor a church just south of Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, I've, been, I've been a ordained elder in the denomination for about 15 years. Uh, prior to that, for just a couple of years, I was in the United Methodist Church myself. Uh, but uh, but, uh, but that's, uh, that's basically what I do. And uh, and, and my responsibility, if you will. Sure. Yeah. I didn't realize you had a background in the United Methodist Church, so that's great. How long yeah. did you serve in the UMC before you switched to CMC? Just a couple of years, okay. and, uh, and 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 in all due respect, it was probably more of um, I was a little bit more uh, on the conservative leaning side, and I realized that at least for me and for myself, it was a direction that I w once I understood a little bit more about the ministry side of things, uh, entering it on the lay side of things, um, I, I started seeking a different avenue. Um, and, and that's how I landed with the Congregational Methodist Church because of the, because of the foundational principles and differences uh, uh, that I'm sure we will get into here in sure. just a few moments. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that, that drew me to the Congregational Methodist Church. So you're one of these that just out of a sense of integrity uh, made the switch before any of this, this really started going on because it's just a better fit for you and you were God made a way for you to join the CMC. Yes, and, 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 I'll, and, and, and I'll say that most likely uh, I think a lot of people would uh, agree with this. I'm not saying everyone has to, but the the specific circumstances that the UMC is going through right now is probably more of a of a of, 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 of an indication of, of something that has been going on for some time that's not specific to social issues and those sorts of things. But those are those are the end results of maybe operational organizational hierarchical types of things that that uh that it was was just not a direction that i felt that i needed to be involved with for myself yeah, seven to, uh, yeah. Years ago. that's a very respectful way of phrasing it so um just before we get into the the questions that i have uh where are you joining me from today uh, I am actually just north of Tupelo, Mississippi, uh, it, uh, on, on my home, and uh, uh, have a ha have a home study here, and um, and and you already know this because uh, we spoke very briefly. Mm -hmm. Behind the shades is a is a farmland, but I'm not a farmer, uh, so uh, I'm I'm in the I'm in the business of uh, of of of, of uh, harvesting souls, not not wheat. Exactly. So. <laughs> yeah. And then, so just so there's a sense of uh, mm. scope and scale, the yes. the Congregational Methodist Church is is it just within the United States or is it a global body? It's a global body, uh, United States and Mexico. Okay, uh, we we have uh, we have about twenty or thirty churches. I'll 
pick a number right in between, say 25 churches in the country of Mexico, all of our other churches are in the in the United States. Uh, historically have been from Texas to Georgia, down to Florida and up to Missouri, but that has changed before the past year, but it's also especially changed in the past several months. We are in many, many states that we never had a presence in before. So so how many how many congregations, if you had to spitball total at the moment? About right now about two hundred. Okay. Okay. So um as we're getting into some of the cultural differences between mm -hmm. the CMC and the UMC, the GMC, all these others, uh already right. you're giving an impression of um Perhaps the CMC doesn't take themselves quite as seriously as the UMC does with the titles, at least, or with the the the, the hierarchy. Um, would you agree that that is one cultural difference among many between your tribe and the uh, UMC? I, I like um, culturally speaking, I like the word "different" more than "better" or sure. "comparison," only because. Uh, because it's just different. It, sure. it doesn't mean one is to me. It doesn't mean one, one is better than the other. Uh, we we do not. We most certainly don't consider ourselves better than uh, UMC or any of the others. But we are vastly different in our polity and our governance. Mm -hmm. uh, we we actually celebrate the uniqueness of every congregation uh, in our movement and uh, at, both in size and personality. Uh, and and we do not put any barriers between the local church and the work of that local church, and that's the hierarchical uh, difference. And uh, you know, you had asked about you you asked about the numbers of churches. Uh, we it's not just the numbers of churches we have; it's it's the very wide difference in sizes of churches. You know, like any denomination, probably eighty percent of our of our church numbers are anywhere from 20 to 75 people on a normal basis, but we have multiple churches in the, in the hundreds, uh, uh, several churches and over a thousand. We have one large church uh, just south of Atlanta that has a membership of about, of about 9,000. Uh, and they uh, they have an average attendance between eight and ten thousand every Sunday. So yeah. uh, so it's it, but that is what we celebrate is the uniqueness and the personality difference between those. Now, theologically speaking, uh, as far as our current books of discipline, uh, ourselves and even the UMC uh, are identical uh, from 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 the imprint of the doctrinal or excuse me the, uh, theological speaking yeah um, like the articles are, of religion would be exactly the same yeah yeah and now the, the some would say that there are some differences in the actual implementation of some of those th theology and maybe some of the, the openness to accept other theological uh, leanings we don't uh, we will never do that we could not exist uh, uh, as a denomination without that but we, we most certainly have some doctrinal differences, mm -hmm. not theology differences, but doctrinal differences. And uh, one in which we, we embrace fully Wesley's doctrine of accountability. Mm -hmm. We also embrace uh, Wesley's doctrine of holiness. Those are two very important aspects that are, that are beyond the theological uh, comparisons, but actual in practice doctrine and uh, accountability is probably one of the most important ones for us because because we are made up of autonomous churches, but we still have to have an integral part of, uh, of our being and of our of our uh, weekly life and daily life that that holds each other accountable. So, yeah. So you and I are both in the same place where we don't have any interest in trying to say this is the best denomination. This is number two. No. This is number three. Rather, right. the, the framework I think both of us have is they're just different congregations with different right. uh, loyalties and, and values and personalities. And because of that, they're going to fit better or worse in different covenant bodies. So That's we're right. just sketching right now what, yeah. what your denomination is like so that local churches can say, hey, that really Absolutely. seems to fit well with my, my congregation or, hey, that doesn't fit very well at all because there's no point. Yeah. And trying to right. a, fit a square peg into a round hole, so we don't want to do that. Right. Um, That's correct. So you've you've already done a good job, kind of laying down some of the broad strokes of what makes the the CMC 
d- distinct, if I were to put it in my own words, um, the the interpretation of Scripture and of the foundational doctrines of Methodism is not as loose. There's there's not as much um, leeway with broad interpretations of as to what it could mean or bringing in new interpretations. Rather, it it, it is a much um, more confined understanding of what these things mean and how they are meant to be lived out. And I think I heard you say. There is a much more. There's much more concern with maintaining uh, integrity within that system than perhaps in some other bodies. Did I hear those that, things correctly? That's correct. I mean, our, our I, I use the analogy when I speak to churches about the about two rails, uh, uh, similar to a train track. If you have if you have two rails that are standard that that are that are firmly on a foundation, that train is not going to go off track. It's going to go in the in the direction it's intended. Sometimes it might go slower than you want it to, but it's always going to be going in the in the cro- proper direction. And 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 we consider our two rails our statements of doctrine mm-hmm. and our articles of religion and and we actually we actually cannot we're actually forbidden by our own discipline to change either one of those very good so we so uh, which means that which is probably what has sustained us for 171 years mm-hmm. in that 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 we we cannot put anything in the book of discipline that that is contradictor that contradicts the articles of religion or statements of doctrine and we actually cannot change a single word of our articles of religion or statements of doctrine that's why when some people read our the beginning of our book of discipline it look i get the comments that say well this looks like it was written in the 1800s because it was uh-huh. it was written yeah. in 1852 and and we cannot change it and we're forbidden to which which always will bring us back to those two rails every uh-huh. single time i'm sure you have the same idiom where you are but uh, a common saying here is if it ain't broke don't fix it so. right right and, and 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 we firmly believe that that those those two um those two rails of uh, uh, meaning our Wesleyan foundation fully mm-hmm. and being scripturally faithful, uh, you can't go wrong. I mean, scripture is never going to change. Uh, and then if you can base everything on, especially that one rail being scripturally faithful, yeah. then you know you're always going to be okay. Yeah, right. So I think that's that's a good way to kind of lay out, you know, for those who know the UMC, they know that, that there is a hermeneutic uh, pertaining to the scriptures and doctrinal standards that that is, um, uh, I would say, left leaning. I, I I don't think we need you to comment on that. Uh, nor do I see you chomping at the bit to do it. I think the saying's champing at the bit. Anyway, um, so there is a distinct um, way. Uh, I was also interested in just asking more broadly about any other presuppositions that, uh, as the CMC operates together, do, do you gather in annual conferences? We do. So we, we do. We have uh, as we you have gather- annual conferences. Yeah, at annual conferences every year, uh, general conferences every two years. So as you guys uh, get together, what are the presuppositions mm-hmm. that you all hold in common that informs the kind of connection that you have that is distinct, not just from the United Methodist Church, but maybe from many other denominations as well? What What's some of the flavor there that defines you guys? It, it's really more about uh, our regional or Again, in, in the general conference level, our, our our connection together that is that is not from top down, and 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 this is probably a good place for me to interject why we started as a denomination. Yeah, please. Yeah, I was going to ask you the history, so go yeah, ahead. Yeah, because this will kind of then explain why we operate the way we do and connect the way we do. Um, and, and, and this is something you can't really get off of our website unless you did a lot of research. Uh, and that is that we started, we were, the, there were eight gentlemen that were part of the United, uh, excuse me, part of the Methodist Episcopalian South denomination that the Episcopalian side of that group in the mid 1800s was starting to go into a much more hierarchical form of government where the denomination had a full authority over a local church and ministers. Mm-hmm. And they just felt that that was not in keeping with Wesley's teachings. They worked with the denomination to try to get the denomination not to go that direction, but ultimately the they, they decided that. So these founders of the Congregational Methodist Church started 
it on the first precept that we would not be a hierarchical form of government. So there's no bishops. Will, that's right. Okay. No, no bishops, no, uh, no, no DSs, no uh, chancellors, no, you know, we do not have that type of structure okay. uh, because nobody, we, we actually, when we provide uh, for churches that affiliate with us, we provide a, a recommended local church organizational structure, okay. you know, everything from committees to, it, it's just a suggestions that we give that work well within our work well within our polity. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, it actually all flows up through the pastor and we only make one entry above the pastor and uh and we recommend that that entry be supreme leader jesus christ <laughs> and, and then that's it we actually put that in print because you call him supreme pro- leader really right well because because we we do not believe that there should be anything in between that that church and the work outside the doors of that church. I hear you. Uh, yeah. And so, so that because to us that means hierarchy. That means somebody yeah. that is not connected back to your original question yeah. to that local body mm-hmm. that is telling the local body how to do things. We we that's why we push things through annual conferences because on annual conferences are more regional. Right. They're, they're, the region of the uh, 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 middle, ten, uh, excuse me, West Tennessee is much different from the Georgia conference, even though we're both kind of in the South, we're very different, have very different types of churches um, uh, and very different from Texas. I can tell you now I've, I've, uh, I've gotten to know and, and, and love some, some brothers and sisters in, 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 uh, in Texas in areas that I've never heard of that are so spread out. Uh, but again, they, they operate differently than other conferences. So, so there should not be, we do not feel, there should not be somebody sitting in, a, in a, an authoritative position telling each conference what they should do and how they should do it. They should determine that. And thus, when a church affiliates with us, they actually are a member of they are actually affiliated with and a member of that annual conference, mm-hmm. not of the denomination. And that's an important yeah. stipulation that that, uh, that that everything flows through the annual conferences. Of course, the annual conference answers to and through the general conference yeah. uh, and the denomination, but but everything flows through the annual conference, even even um, even credentialing it's done at the annual conference level except for the cases where we are transferring credentials in as we are right now from uh, from other denominations but. yeah yeah well it, there, there are several senses in which that's the case for the united methodist church and the global sure. church as well yeah. global methodist right. church um so the the historical portion was this the late 1800s early 1900s when you guys came about mid mid 1800 1852 oh wow okay so this was early on in the mec south so you guys came about whenever they were they were already seeing the writing on the walls they said no we're we're gonna uh be against this hierarchy we're gonna protect the integrity of of individual churches and clergy and not convolute it with all of these structures that that uh serve as intermediaries between churches and jesus you just got jesus jesus um uh, clergy and and laity, uh, do you you guys would probably confess something resembling the priesthood of all believers? Yes, absolutely, one hundred percent. Yeah, uh, and 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 I don't want to leave the structure part too loose. We we do have a structure, we just don't have it as authoritative structure. You know, for example, we do have a president, vice president, division directors, and a controller, but they're all elected. They're elected by delegates that that go to general conference and either re-elect or elect replacements for those positions and they are they are not career positions gotcha. so the the president of our denomination pastors a church in bedford texas the vice president pastors a church in laurel mississippi mm-hmm. my uh, uh, division director for church ministries pastors of church in weaver alabama we're we're pastors th- these are not career paid positions in, in as much yeah, I learned just yesterday that's kind of how the Assemblies of God operates as well. Right, and right, so, yeah. Um, yeah, this is a very different uh, polity, yeah. ecclesiastical structure. And um, I, I didn't know this until we were speaking today about the Mexican contingent, but uh, Mexican yeah. brothers and sisters are able to participate uh, equally with, with uh, oh, American. Absolutely. Okay, so it's a oh, good fellowship. Yeah. 
Yes, absolutely. And, um, and we also have, a, separate from the churches that we have in Mexico, we also have a, a very, uh, very intense uh, missions division, which has a, a missions uh, presence within Mexico that outside of the actual physical churches also. Yeah, yeah. So for, as we're thinking about congregations that would be very drawn to the Congregational mm -hmm. Methodists that are coming out of the United Methodist Church in particular, what, yeah. what things do you think that they would be really drawn to about the, mm -hmm. the Congregational Methodists? Probably the most uh, important thing would be the autonomy. Yeah. Uh, where we, we since, since we have, um, again, I, I mentioned earlier the rails, the, the, uh, the doctrinal standards and the scriptural faithfulness. Mm -hmm. what our, our, our position is as long as a church is not violating those two rails, a, a local church can make their own decisions. They, 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 can, they can set their own churches up the way they want to. They, can, they hire their own pastor. They keep their from as long as they want. They, they build a building, sell land, whatever they want to do without the interference or the approval process through the denomination. Uh, be, and we as a denomination respect that local church from top to bottom to operate independently, but we use the word autonomous because independent can be a little bit misconstrued. It means anything goes, sure. we're, we're gonna always go back to those rails. We're always gonna go back to our foundation. So, so, the, so those churches that are, that are interested in, in, uh, in, in basically uh, um, uh, calling their own uh, make, making their own decisions, calling their own shots as far as the local congregation is concerned. That's what was really, that's what we actually celebrate uh, in, in a big way. Um, so do you guys help local churches find clergy or do they do yeah. that all themselves? Okay, no, you... We, 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 we do. Now, we do not we do not appoint pastors. We yeah. do not send pastors to churches. Uh, it's, it is a call system. Mm -hmm. and, and that is um, that is dynamically different from anything that anyone in the UMC has ever dealt with before. And because of that, we recognize, first and foremost, churches need some training in that respect. So what we do, if, uh, if a church asks us to, again, that, that's always the if, because the church has the cho choice whether to engage with us on that subject. But if a church asks us to, we will step in as church ministries. Yeah. We will step, uh, division, we'll step in and, and help them learn how to develop a pastor search team uh, so that they understand the, the the importance of the connection between that team and the congregation. Mm -hmm. That the congregation is going to make the ultimate decision. Sure. So it's in, but but you can have the congregation as a whole making every interview and, and reviewing every sure. resume. So yeah. so so we will help a, a church in in, uh, in in the process. Beyond the process then we go into uh, where do you get potential candidates from? And that certainly can include us uh, uh, as an option. It can include uh, other clergy in other denominations, Wesleyan, of course, preferred, uh, mm -hmm. that can transfer into us or through our education division, uh, the credentialing system of um, uh, uh, either lay system or the the process to become ordained can be done with within the confines of our denomination, not outside to other organizations. That we would uh, we would allow that process to take place. That but ultimately, whatever a church decides, whether they pull from one of those three sources or they on their own choose their own pastor. Mm -hmm. We have no we have no right to tell a church who they can or can't have as their pastor. Right. It, it's always going to be the local church's decision. Uh, if they in, if they involve us, of course, we have the ability to do background checks and different things that are very important. Yeah. But we can't force that upon churches because of the autonomy nature of our of our of our of our, of our setup. So we're we're going to in the show notes to this have a, a link to a document that that compares and contrasts the CMC and several other uh, denominations together. So uh, people can review that and fit this information together as well as they like. Um, just just briefly, in, in the event that there is a local church that doesn't really want to hold to the Wesleyan 
faith or obey the general norms and rules of the CMC, uh, wow. there is not a scenario where you guys are uh, uh, punishing them in any sense or, or compelling them to do things against their will. Rather, you guys just exit that denomination or that congregation. Is that right? That is correct. We, okay. we have the ability within our within the confines of our book of discipline to engage with that, try to help the church through that. But in the end, if they are not going to uh, abide by those two foundational principles, again, doctrinal integrity and scriptural faithfulness, yeah. then yes, we would we would disaffiliate them from us if that be the case. And so connected to that, there is no trust clause in place. Is that correct? No, okay. no, we do not have a trust clause. Uh, we've never had a trust clause. Right. Um, uh, there, there are uh, some, some that have reviewed our book of discipline. There's, there's elements of it that appears that it could be somewhat of a trust clause because of how we recommend uh, churches to have a language on their deeds. But, but understand that that's typically done from a church that is starting as a congregational Methodist church, not coming into our movement, but that, and that potentially has the assistance from the denomination or the annual conferences to, to start a church or build a church or plant a church. So, so in some respects, we have some of that language, but, but we do, but it's only, it's only in those cases, we actually do not require churches to change their deeds after they affiliate with us. We give them recommended language if they want that direction, but we don't require that. So with the Free Methodist Church, as I understand it, the Free Methodist, uh, any United Methodist churches that disaffiliate from the UMC and come FMC, the, any, any church buildings they have at that point are grandfathered in and belong to the congregation. However, anything new that they build does have the trust clause applied to it for the FMC. That is not the right. case with the CMC? No, okay. no, not at all. Okay, and, and 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 what you just described is my understanding, at, um, and and also my understanding was is that was a, 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 a something that was put into place for UMC churches coming in mm -hmm. uh, that uh, they they've uh, they've they put that grandfather clause in there to for for that purpose. But yeah. I'm not speaking on their behalf because sure. that would be their that would be their answer. Okay, so so we've already covered trust clause and property. Um, let's talk more about how material assets are managed, shared. Could you talk some about any shared funding, any um, bureaucratic uh, support? H how does money work within the CMC? Uh, we're, we're very open with our with, with our financials. Uh, I'll, we are we are um, uh, we are ECFA certified. Uh, we get audited every year. Um, every, <laughs> I, I put it this way, talking to churches that any member of any congregation of any CMC church, if they want to find out how much we spend on, on paper clips, you can find out. Uh, so because if people are not familiar, the UMC is not at all transparent with any of this. They don't openly report assets in this way to right. anybody except those at the top. So um, this would be another cultural difference between the yes. UMC and the CMC. Now, Go ahead. Now, that being said, that means that sometimes we might have somebody complain because we spend too much money on paper clips. Uh -huh. And that's, yeah. that's just part of our polity. And we, you know, we're, we, we're, we're always, and that, so there, there's some, that, that there's, that isn't not necessarily always good, but we feel like we're going to err on the other side. We want to be accountable. We don't feel like you can be fully accountable unless you're fully transparent. That's yeah. that's basically our bottom line. Uh, but um, uh, so uh, assets, uh, yes, uh, you, we have a matter of fact. The, the even churches that can that have considered coming on board with us, we give them ahead of time a, a, a snapshot of our entire financials for the past couple of years right. as the denomination. So you know. Uh, you know, so you'll see you you see with that, uh, you know what our what our uh, uh, how we how we disperse money that comes into us, what what divisions they go to, how it supports missions, the connectivity uh, beyond that. We we show on there, you know, our assets, our you know uh, what we have. Uh, we we don't we are financially secure. We have no uh, debt as a denomination, um, and uh, and and we do try to put uh, all of the funds that come in to proper use 
for uh, for covering administrative uh, and also mission work because that is ultimately our entire purpose is is mission work. So uh, there is uh, a, a a sense of uh, do you call them apportionments? We don't. Apportionments is that word that's used where you're told what you're supposed to give. Uh -huh. uh, ours is different. Uh, and and I, if I may, I'd, I'd be more than happy to explain what, how, how ours is set up. Yes, please. Uh, now, you're going to hear a lot of words uh, like ask, recommend, suggest, because that's literally what we do as a denomination. Yeah. Though we recommend that every church tithe. Uh, we and what we mean by that is is that we 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 recommend that every church set aside ten percent of their non designated income as a tithe. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not asking for that ten percent to come to us, but we're just asking the church to set it aside. Mm -hmm. We then suggest the distribution of that to be the following: we suggest one percent to go to the church's assigned annual conference. Uh, and then the and then they would have the say so along with the other churches how that money is spent of course at annual conference that's the whole purpose of it there um, then four percent to the general conference uh, excuse me four uh, percent five percent to the general conference which includes all connection purposes including the mission work that we do outside of the United States okay the remaining four percent, we we ask that every church keep that local so so that church finds a a local ministry or ministries that they want to support in their own community mm -hmm. there's no approval process within the denomination that church makes the decision and then you just you follow through with it so those three percentages equal the 10 percent mm -hmm. however once again like the pastoral call uh, whatever each church chooses to do, whether the total 10% or individual percentages is a local church choice. Yeah. We cannot dictate to the church what it must be. And we don't ask a church, what will it be next year? We just ask that a church fulfill their, uh, their commitment, whatever they make as a congregation. Yeah. The, what, what, uh, well, the, so in any person who's looking at a new system, they look at how it can go wrong and how it can be abused. This is obviously a system that only works whenever you have good faith partners involved. Um, and it sounds like you, you generally can count on that. Right. You, you could say the same thing about um, each person listening to this right now mm -hmm. about your own church. Yeah. That you make commitments budget-wise and, and, and ministry-wise and, and supporting different things. And, and you are dependent on people in your, in your congregation to support it accordingly, but you're stepping out on faith that you will ultimately have that financial support to follow through with all the ministry activities of your church. Same with us. So yeah. we, we are, do all of our churches give? No, we, not all of them do, and we cannot force them to. But uh, are we able to sustain uh, what we're doing now, even with the percentage of churches, some that give and some that don't? Yes, and that's what we're doing right now. And we, and, 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 and it's, uh, you know, it, of course, it's not about, what we're doing, it's about the Lord doing that through us. And uh, so we're, we're uh, so, so yes, it's, a, it, it's, it's very, that's why we call it a tithe because, because it is very much similar to how a local church would, would, would be able to do what they need to do. And, and there are times that we might have to do things differently as a denomination if there's not funding. One example of that was uh, at one point in time, Wesley College, uh, Wesley College was always owned by our denomination from day one. Uh, before that, it was Westminster College, just south of Dallas, Texas, owned by the Congregational Methodist denomination. We went through the very difficult process of shutting that college down about eight years ago. And the reason is because the funding was being, was being uh, absorbed that was coming in from our churches for the denomination absorbed to try to keep it open. And it was not financially responsible to us to the extent that we as an entire denomination, meaning delegates at general conference 
made the decision to close the college down. And so it's not always, you know, pleasant things that have to happen, but we're going to make the decisions based on what our financials can, can handle. Well, yeah. And you've just given a portrait of a very different culture than what I'm accustomed to, where if there were constituent churches that habitually were not willing to pay anything towards the connection, wow. they would be uh, their their pastors would be changed whether or not they wanted them to. They would get a pastor that would help them in uh, that direction, and uh, there would be talk about a hostile takeover um, because sure. they have. Sure. So there's no heavy-handed leadership like that within the CMC. You have constituent members that give as much as they want, and right. you collectively make do with what you get. Just a very right. different dynamic. So. Right. It's actually a similar dynamic to myself. I've been in, uh, in 15 years, I've served in two churches mm -hmm. and um, uh, the, 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 neither one of the churches, including the one I'm in now, do, I don't, I do not know who gives what. I don't okay. want to know who gives what, because I am not going to minister to anybody in the church any differently, whether they tithe or not, whether they give anything or not, or what percentage of their income they give mm -hmm. uh, to the church. I am going to be there and support them and minister to them and help them. Uh, we are exactly the same way as a denomination. We're going to always be there, assist churches, help them, help them be uh, relevant churches, healthy churches, regardless of whether or not they're been giving to us or not. Right on. Um, so something I'm personally concerned about within the United Methodist Church, this is my assessment, we saw ourselves as um, the the Church of America. At one point, one in three Americans were a Methodist. We we felt a, a great pressure to minister to people where they are, to uh, minister to the culture where it is, and um, the rhetoric used to be at least start with where they are and lead them to the kingdom of God or lead them to Jesus. I, I don't think that that's in place so much anymore, but the thing that is still in place is we minister to people where they are. Uh, we don't we don't necessarily minister against the culture. Or um, I, 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 if I were being uh, more direct about what they're actually doing, they're they're ministering to a certain subset of the culture, the cultural left, which is really pushing back against the historical right. But but the overall concern I have is the posture that a covenant body takes towards the world and its culture and norms. Um, the United Methodist Church is decidedly not hostile to worldly impulses and and desires. Does the CMC have a, a coherent, consistent witness uh, with alongside the world against the world? Um, uh, how would you characterize the denomination's posture with uh, this this ever changing and yet always the same world? Um. Kind of goes back to the rails. Okay. <laughs> and, I, and I told you in the beginning that I probably refer back to those a lot. Mm -hmm. It really has to do with scripture because if we're going to, if we're going to stay aligned with scripture and be scripturally faithful, then those things that, that challenge the church from the world and from culture, mm -hmm. scripture is always going to have an answer for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as long as we're being faithful to scripture, then, then, then we're, then, then anyone will always be able to know where we stand. So, uh, so the, the latest uh, uh, society uh, impacts on the church itself are really not an impact on us uh, in that we already know how we stand because scripture is very clear about those subjects. Um, now, that does not mean that we are closed off to individuals that struggle with things that are culturally and society uh, uh, against scripture. We actually want them in the church. Yeah. We, we would never, um, we would never, uh, and hope, I wish I could speak to every sing, single congregation, but because of the autonomy nature of our denomination, that doesn't mean that every church feels would do the exactly what I'm about to say, yeah. but I would hope that we would all be open to anybody any time that came into the church because they're not going to get God's word from society. They're, they're only going to get it from, from the church itself. Uh, so, uh, but we do have to draw a line somewhere. Right. Um, and that line is drawn when it comes to leadership. Um, leadership, teaching, 
preaching in our churches, we have to make sure that that there is not a general sense of anything goes, it's fine. We'll look the other way. We will accept a not a very uh, visible non-Christian lifestyle in an individual, um, and uh, and and then put them in a leadership position within the church, or or not put them in, but uh, but 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 stand by and say nothing when a church chooses to do that locally. We have to, that's the accountability side of things. We have to be accountable to what we say and state that we believe in. So well, to be fair, when you look at what happened in the United Methodist Church, it isn't that anyone was flagrantly um, uh, living and preaching in the face of uh, the gospel. It was more that they used the same language, but they meant it somewhat differently. Yes. And then they made vows that they didn't really mean. And right. the, the right. people in leadership at the time didn't really have it in them. They, they either didn't understand how cultural leftism works or they just didn't have it in them to make those hard, mean decisions to say, no, we, we, we can tell right. you don't mean the same things. You're not interested in the same project. So even though you're appealing to us, no, right. you can't come in. Um, so right. for someone like me, I've, I've, I've joined uh, – I've been ordained in the Global Methodist Church. I'm saying loudly up front, I do not want to replicate what happened in the United Methodist Church. So I want us to be able to have that, to have our eye on cultural leftism and and the way in which it kind of insidiously enters into institutions and corrupts them. And I want to have people in leadership that can see that and um, uh, hold the line. And so right. would I be right in hearing you saying when you're talking about accountability, that's a code word sort of for leadership has their eye on what the threats are and has yes. the discernment to identify those people as they try to come in and right. nip that in the bud before people like that are put in leadership positions. Without question. And, and, and I could go one step further and say that we, we um, a lot of churches and individuals in churches are responding to the current cultural situation as this is awful, this is terrible, and I can't imagine it being any worse. Uh, those of us that have ears to the rail knows what's coming. This is only the beginning. This is not the worst subjects that the church is going to have to be uh, is going to have to be faced with. Yeah. Uh, so we always have to be ready for that next cultural push, that next thing that would make the first thing that we're going through maybe right now as as nothing <laughs> compared to that. We we and and we know what's coming because we read the book of Revelation. We know that we know and 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 that really come that really is what I mean when when I talk about or what we mean as a denomination. We talk about being scripturally faithful. It mm -hmm. literally means that we believe the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is without error. We know how the book ends in Revelation with Jesus coming back and everything we do as a denomination must be focused toward building his kingdom, everything, uh, because that is ultimately what will happen. But between now and then, things are going to get worse and worse and worse. And this subjects or the subjects that are on the table today are extremely critical, but they're not going to be the last ones that are going to be, that are going to, that the churches are going to be faced with. I think there are a lot of people where if they hear that part, they're going to be like, okay, I can get along with these people. You know, this, <laughs> right. when, when you hear someone read Revelation in more than just a figurative sense, but to see it as forecasting in a very real sense, the dynamics ahead, that really makes a loud statement about what, what, uh, the biblical hermeneutic is, but also whether um, to what degree this particular tribe, uh, tribe being represented here, identifies yeah. with the world. And so, right. what you know, yeah. um, the mentality that comes about when you read Revelation enough is uh, Christ died for the world; He loves the world. However, this world is not our home, and That's our right. when right. when the chips are down, our loyalty is with Christ Jesus, Absolutely. not with this world. Right. So I'm, I'm thinking from what we've already talked about, I can answer some of these questions myself. My next question was, where do you depart from the norms and beliefs of the United Methodist Church? We've already talked about the integrity of the congregation over the hierarchy of the church. We've talked about um, the principle of liberty, of transparency, 
uh, of uh, trust but verify is kind of how I would say you ride that line of accountability, accountability and freedom. Right. Um, to be clear, there there really isn't a difference between what the UMC and the CMC believe on paper. There isn't any significant doctrinal difference, right? Um, theological differences, no. Right. Uh, yeah. Do, uh, doctrine, uh, when it when it comes to discipline, though, I, yes. I believe that sometimes you're going to you're going to see some differences. Uh, and this is one of those areas where some churches may not feel comfortable with our system in that. And, and this is full disclosure. That's what, what, what you asked me to do today. Yes, please, yeah. um, there are some churches that, that want to be told, want to have a liturgy. They want to know what we're going to preach on, you know, and what all the churches are going to preach on. Uh, if that be the case, they want to know, be told what to, what to sing, how to, uh, how to how to worship? What elements to have in worship? What yeah. can the what can the the pastor wear? What stoles or not can they wear? All of those things they want to be directed with that and say this is how you must do things, and that comes from the top down from a hierarchical system. Uh, and and in the discipline, uh, there there's very specific things you you must do this this way. We don't do that. Uh, we do offer direction, especially when something could, you know, when, when something could be uh, done that would be against, you know, our our sacraments or or different things. Absolutely, we 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 have to make sure that there's some some structure there. Mm -hmm. But 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 those churches that want to be told how to do things probably won't work well within a polity type of system of ours where we will help give advice, yeah. but it's really the local church's decision. So uh, that, 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 is the, that, is, that is probably one of the biggest differences. Um, we, we don't, um, and, and part of that also goes back to clergy. Uh, and, and, and there is a, there is a very specific structural difference and that is the employment. Uh, the pastors do not work for our, for the Congregational Methodist Church. Uh, and, and anyone in the UMC now realizes that even though you're paying the pastor out of your church budget, the pastor works for the denomination. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and it's, it's a different structure with us. The, the pastor works for the church and is paid by the church in us. And we simply are handling the credentialing and the accountability side mm -hmm. of that pastor, but we do not have their employment under us. Now we provide all the things that a church needs mm -hmm. to, uh, to uh, for that employment, we we provide the benefits uh, programs that the church can participate in, medical retirement, and all that. But but we don't, as a denom as a denomination, require those things or provide those things other than the relationship with the organization that handles it. That's all. Uh, <laughs> there are people for whom that's very important, and there are clergy who I think would really be sad to be preaching the revised common lectionary and be the only one in the CMC doing so, or uh, right. there being no uh, book of worship. I, I think there are uh, clergy in particular who've taken a lot of uh, comfort sure. and and uh, sure. appreciation in that. So I think it's good to volunteer that that's just really not, it's not that you can't follow the revised common lectionary. It's just, there is no cultural pressure whatsoever from within right. the CMC for other clergy or churches to do so, which is that's correct. very that, important that is correct. for some. So, Which is why if somebody visits one church versus another, they may have a completely different experience with the one CMC church to another, where with the, with the UMC, uh, not all, but for the most part, you will know that you're in a UMC church. Uh, well, the uh, worship you know, wars really did a number on the UMC, and you do yeah. find a very big cultural difference usually between rural and urban rich and poor churches within the UMC. Right. Um, right. And then, of course, we've allowed for a huge array of different doctrinal positions to be represented from the pulpit. So, um, yeah. but even so, it, it seems to me as though, even though you would probably have a large variety in worship styles within the CMC, you you probably do center around a common core of doctrinal 
norms and teachings more than the UMC has. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I, I, I want to say I won't say absolutely to the first part of that, but not really in comparison to UMC because yeah. I because I want to be respectful of respectful of that. But sure. but but absolutely. I mean, there. You know, our our, um, our our focus is always going to be kingdom building. <laughs> so uh, it's it's outreach and uh, you know invitation times are are a norm with our you know with our church. It's, it's like you know that we we want to give everybody an opportunity to respond to the Holy Spirit and uh, you know we we you know all those are we're that is the evangelical part of our denomination. I never even mentioned that word from the beginning of this conversation, but but it, it, but that's what makes us evangelical. Is we're always focused on the kingdom building side. Well, that's that's that was the final place I wanted to end. So with the kingdom building, that's the macro, but the micro of kingdom building is just making disciples. And Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, the Global Methodist Church has a, 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 a mission statement on the kind of disciples that they're making. Of course, the United Methodist Church does as well, um, and and they sound great, but they're broad terms that can be applied in lots of different directions. So I, I thought it might be good to end with you on what kind of disciples does the Congregational Methodist Church hope to make? What 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 kind of ethos um, are they trying to build in in individual people who who come into your your group. The, the most important thing for us is that we provide at the at the denomination level the ability for churches to be healthy and relevant. And what we mean by that is that that a a member of that congregation can have the the format, uh, the environment, if you will, to develop as close of a relationship with Christ as they can. Mm -hmm because we believe that that they will never be able to be a, a effective disciple without that type of relationship. And they're only gonna get that through him and not through us because it's not about us. It's not about what we do as a denomination. We just simply want to make sure that we're providing the foundation for them to grow in Christ in that way. So. So it's really more about what he will do with individuals versus what we will do as a denomination, um, and that's really that that's really um, that that's really uh, the the most important thing with us. Excellent. Well, so I'm sure there's a, a thousand more things we could talk about, but um, we wanted to you know time is valuable, and and we're gonna sure. point people in the right directions to. To follow up on these things if they're interested. Uh, Jim, if, if somebody has liked what they've heard from you and they want to follow up and learn more, how should they go about that? A couple of different ways. Uh, first of all, uh, our, our main website, which is a very simple informational website. It's not a, a huge splashy website on purpose. We want to get as much information as quickly as possible to, to churches and congregations. Uh, that are that are interested in us would be go, to go to our website, which is cm-church.org, um, and that gives you all of the basics about our denomination. But there's one particular uh, one particular page that you can go to that's called the affiliate initiative, which at that point starts a process with our church ministries division to respond to churches, to congregations, or clergy. Uh, that are that have an interest in us and that that, that can start a a, a, a direct uh, communication uh, back and forth. Uh, so that would be where I would start with our with would be our website and then uh, the affiliate initiative uh, should you want to engage with us at some point in time. Uh, and uh, and that engagement can can take different flavors, uh, uh, informational packets, books of discipline, whatever whatever we need to do to 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 help churches learn as much about us in a short amount of time as possible. Great. Well, that that seems simple and clear. So um, I guess friends, if you've uh, watched this conversation and you want to learn more about the Congregational Methodist Church and consider uh, a new covenant relationship, then by all means, I, I think this will be a great fit for, for some congregations. So Jim, uh, thank you so much for taking the time with me. Um, you and you. I prayed together before we uh, hit the record button, but I wonder maybe we could close with you just praying for any uh, viewers who are watching who are just in this Absolutely. time of discernment, and perhaps that'd be a good way to close.
Absolutely. Thank you so much. And, and, and God bless your efforts uh, in, in this in this process. So uh, thank you so much. Yes, sir. Lord, I just want to thank you right now. I want to thank you for this time. Lord, you give us uh, you give us time every day. And and, and I just pray that 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 is spent with your work Lord. that that is spent with you talking to you, discerning what you would have us do individually. Lord, I pray that every person that's watching this will have a desire to know what your desire is for them, yes. not just what makes them feel that they should do, but what you would want them to do. Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you in advance that you will provide that. Yes. Lord, I, I do pray for churches and all of the individuals within the churches that are going through these difficult decisions right now. But Lord, I, I also thank you that you've given us scripture yes. and that you remind us in the book of Joshua that, that you commanded us not to be anxious, to not be discouraged because you're right there with us, Lord. And I, and I thank you for that. Yes. Lord, I also just thank you for the reminders through these conversations that we are talking about your church, not ours, your church and everything that we do, that all the decisions that are made and all the side conversations that take place, we always have that reminder that we are talking about only your church. We give you all the praise and the glory. And we thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins that because of his death, his burial, his resurrection, Lord, we can have this conversation and fellowship right now about your church. Mm -hmm. And it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Friends, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'd invite you to, if you're not already, subscribe so you can see the, I'm going to have several other interviews coming up with other Wesleyan uh, representatives. So go ahead and sign on for that. Comment and let us know your thoughts on this and um, just continue to be in prayer for those affected by the fallout in the United Methodist Church. And God bless you as you do so. And I'll see you next time.